Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Cobra Kai and the Star Wars sequel trilogy are very similar stories, but there's one scene that shows why Cobra Kai is a brilliant blending of nostalgia and character, and episodes 7 through 9 are this. Now I'm only going to be talking about the first season of Cobra Kai, so there won't be any spoilers for seasons 2 and 3, and obviously I'm going to talk about the Star Wars sequel trilogy. First, let's talk about the story's many similarities. Each one is a sequel to a 1980s blockbuster and is set 30 years after those events. The story is filled with returning cast members who mentor the newer generation. Now this older generation has never fully healed their emotional wounds, so their emotional baggage and failures are passed on to the younger heroes. And I was left with shame. I let him down, I guess I let you down too. These new heroes focus on learning an ancient art of combat based on an Asian discipline. Now along the way, there are many, many callbacks to the original story. Each hero has two central characters who are descended from the hero and villain from the original story, but the characters side against their families. Your son, he's gone. Don't try to play dad now, you're a pathetic loser. I killed him, I'm so Hey, hey, dad, back off! and one of these characters feels betrayed by their father figure, so they fight for the other side. The hero from the villain's family wants to be trained by the good guy from the first movie, but each of these senseis are reluctant to take on a student. You think that I came to the most unfindable place in the galaxy for no reason at all? Go away. There is a young villain who's been corrupted by the influence of the villain from the original story, and he also forms a connection with the student that's being trained by the series' original good guy. The organization the bad guy works for mandates that everyone wear a black uniform. This group begins the story as underdogs, but soon gains power and eclipses the victories that the heroes won 30 years ago. Suddenly, the good guys are vastly outnumbered by the villains. There's also a moment when the young villain fights against other bad guys, and it's awesome. It's Cobra Kai. <laughs> The villain still has feelings for a member of the original good guy's family, but severs ties with her after harming someone she loves. The evil mastermind villain from the original story returns at the 11th hour of the reboot. But the most important similarity is how these two properties use or misuse their fans' nostalgia, but I'm going to get into that in detail later in the video. So what is the one similar scene that defines the failures and successes of these stories? Well, I think it's the moment that the villain truly started down the dark path. So first let's talk about Miguel, my favorite character from Cobra Kai. Miguel's fall is the heart of the show, and his arc perfectly expresses the show's themes about the dangers of nostalgia. First, let's briefly go over his history, which roughly takes up about one hour of screen time in season one. When we meet him, he's Johnny's super nice, law-abiding neighbor who's a stickler for the rules. Oh, bottles go in the blue bin. A group of teens beat him up before Johnny saves him. This makes the audience sympathize with Miguel, the way the exact same scene in Karate Kid made us root for Daniel LaRusso. Karate here. Karate never here. You understand? I think so. Miguel sees Johnny as a badass father figure, and he wants to be part of his club. Do you think you could teach me? What? No. Well, you could open your own dojo. Look. During his training, he's taught to use his anger as a weapon. This marks the beginning of his fall. In Star Wars terms, this is like Anakin slaughtering the Sand People in Attack of the Clones. Both of these characters learn that their rage can make them stronger. Miguel starts to emulate Johnny by listening to the same music. Oh, that was my mom. I'll uh, call her back later. But it's important to note that he's not emulating the real Johnny. The real Johnny is depressed, he misses his son, and is longing for human connection. Miguel begins to emulate the image of Johnny, the persona that Johnny shows to the world. Lesson one. Strike first. Never wait for the enemy to attack. That isn't actually reflected in his reality. I'd say, get your life in order. But uh, at this point, you're like the meat in your fridge. Miguel is further radicalized after being beaten up at the school dance. But this only makes us root for him more. His training montage is framed heroically, and we want to see the geek get stronger and beat up the bully, just like in the first Karate Kid. Our nostalgia wants history to repeat itself, so we root for this kid to kick some ass. Johnny soon empowers the other dorks from the school. They learn that their cyber bullies are actually cowards. These geeks hiding behind their computers with a bunch of spineless losers. While Hawk remakes himself into the kind of person that he used to be afraid of. It's not just the haircut or the back tattoo. It's a way of life, man. You just gotta feel the energy and just 
live in the moment. Now we've seen each of these characters at their low points, we've empathized with them, and we root for them to conquer their fears. We see Cobra Kai working for these kids, and we're happy for their progress. So Miguel's turning point is halfway through the season, when he defends Sam's honor against Kyler. Up until now, the only real villain in the show has been Kyler and his goons. They're cartoonishly stupidly bad. Oh man, so has freaking diarrhea. Oh, <laughs> we, hey, we should call him Rhea. We desperately want to see Miguel take these punks down. This is like when Luke finally confronted Vader to avenge Obi-Wan, and the fight doesn't disappoint. It is badass. It's not lame-ass karate. It's Cobra Kai. It's incredible, kinetic, creative, grounded, but most importantly, it makes us root for Cobra Kai. We could have never imagined rooting for them back in 1984. This fight is the turning point for the season. It attracts more students to the dojo, saves Johnny's business, and it's where Miguel earns the Cobra Kai gi and becomes Johnny's surrogate son. Things start to turn around, and we celebrate this fight, but it actually marks the beginning of Miguel's downfall. Let's look closer at this scene. It's set in the cafeteria, which up until now has been a setting for the kids' embarrassment. Kyler is bullying Sam, and she begins to move into an attack stance before Miguel steps in. Hey, Kyler! But note that Miguel is actually the aggressor here. Kyler isn't threatening anyone with harm, and when he does shove Miguel, he doesn't try to defuse the situation because he wants a fight. Hell, we all want to fight. We want to see these kids ripped apart. No mercy! But here's the thing. Miguel is in the wrong here true fans of the Karate Kid will remember that this goes against everything Mr. Miyagi taught Daniel. Fighting always last answer to problem. Now Miguel felt like he was justified because he was standing up for Sam. At any point, Miguel could have walked away and defused the situation. Instead, after he shoved a couple times, he wails on them. So the kids cheer, we cheer. Miguel's crush sees him with new eyes. Now this is supposed to be the 80s movie ending. The nerds win, yay! Except Miguel and his fellow students learn the wrong lesson from this fight. They learn that karate is a tool for attack. Attacking makes you strong, and being strong will make your life better. This goes against everything the original Karate Kid stood for. Fighting always last answer to problem. Or, put another way, A Jedi uses the force for knowledge and defense. Never attack. Evil never starts off evil. People generally have the best of intentions. The Republic became the Empire out of a desire for security. Anakin became Darth Vader to protect Padme, and Miguel uses violence to defend Sam's honor. Miguel is yet another angry young man radicalized by the obsolete dogma of an older generation. This is how terrorist groups have always attracted members. They find the poor, the angry, the disenfranchised, and they make promises. New uniforms, slogans, revenge, power. If you're not strong on the inside, you can't be strong on the outside. The cafeteria fight starts Miguel down a dark path. Beating up Kyler didn't get rid of his anger. His rage is still there, it's just looking for another target, someone else to punch. Later in the season, he and Sam have a very mild misunderstanding, but now he sees himself as the alpha male and he takes the offense personally. Still nothing? Nope. And then he lashes out at Sam at the beach party. I texted and called you all day and you couldn't answer me back once? At the tournament, he spells out his new radicalized worldview to Sam. You have to strike first. You don't wait for the enemy to attack. I don't even know who you are anymore. And his descent is complete when he deliberately injures Robbie for daring to embarrass him in front of his girl. Watching Miguel's slow descent made me wish that the Star Wars sequel trilogy took this same care with Ben Solo's story. Now, these movies have a lot of problems. Unoriginality, inconsistency, characters and plot points introduced and dropped, but I think they mostly suffer for never showing us who Ben Solo is. My favorite part of Rise of Skywalker, after Babu Frick, <laughs> is Adam Driver's performance after Ben Solo returns. He suddenly injects the role with humor, <clears throat> charm, and passion. Imagine if we could have seen this Ben at the beginning of the series, then observed his fall from grace. So let's talk about Force Awakens, Kylo's turn, and the danger of using nostalgia as a storytelling device. But actually, I had a hard time figuring out exactly when Kylo Ren turns to the dark side. So I asked Reba, the Screen Crush AI, for help. Reba? Hello, I am Reba, the Screen Crush AI who analyzes movies. According to the structure of the film's screenplay, 
Kylo Ren became the dark side when he murders his father, beloved hero Han Solo. The scene occurs immediately after Ginger Nazi gains the favor of giant Hugh Hefner. We tracked their reconnaissance ship to the Elenium system. Good. Kylo Ren wants to make Snoke happy. We know this because they spoke earlier in the film. By the grace of your training, I will not be seduced. That means they have a relationship. Han and Kylo meet at the Starkiller base pit. Beloved hero Han Solo calls Kylo by a name he does not like. Ben! They stand on a bridge that symbolizes the two paths Kylo Ren may choose, the dark side or the other one. Half of his face is lit with the red light to show he is half bad, red is bad, like we see in the other movies. Other half of his face has light, and this movie tells us light is good. There's still light in him, I know it. But as long as there's light, we got a chance. Kylo Ben is sad. He might become good, but then he does not. After penetration by death light, beloved hero Han Solo touches his child's face and dies. That is how justice for Han began. Actually, Reba, I hate to argue with you, but that's not when Kylo Ben became evil. But he killed beloved hero Han Solo. But before that, he killed a defenseless old man, slaughtered a village, tortured a prisoner, violated a woman, aided interstellar genocide, and ruined a computer. I wouldn't expect a machine to understand, because Force Awakens is structured to make you think that this is when Ben Solo turns evil, but he actually broke bad years before the movie even started. But then... The flaw of Force Awakens is that too much happens off screen. We never get to see who Ben Solo was, how he was tempted to the dark side, and so we don't ever really root for him to be redeemed. Now, we're meant to think that Han Solo's murder is his fault because we feel nostalgic for the character of Han Solo. Yet, we don't know anything about their relationship. There's just this line. And Han Solo, I feel like he's the father you never had. He would have disappointed you. So this scene has no stakes. It's not a son murdering his father, it's beloved hero Han Solo getting stabbed by some guy that we know nothing about. Every piece of information about Kylo Ren is revealed through exposition. I know where you come from before you called yourself Kylo Ren. By the grace of your training, I will not be seduced. In the hands of your father, Han Solo, even master of the knights of ren i feel it again the pull to the light an apprentice turned against him destroyed it all there's too much vader in him that's why i wanted him to train with luke it was snoke he seduced our son to the dark side i'm afraid that you will never be as strong as darth vader your son he's gone he was weak and foolish like his father so i destroyed him now compare this to Rey. Visually, we see that she's lonely and was abandoned by her family. Or Finn, who we know is traumatized by war before we even see his face. Kylo Ren is not an actual character. He's a cipher for other people's feelings. We only see him through the eyes of other characters. He makes Han and Leia feel sad. He makes Rey feel angry, he makes Finn feel afraid. We don't actually understand who he is now or who he was before his turn. We don't know why he was seduced to the dark side. We only know that somehow our heroes from the original trilogy failed to raise him right. So we only want to see him turn good because it would make Han, Luke, and Leia happy. His fall means our heroes failed, so his redemption would mean they succeeded. So the actual moment when Ben turns to the dark side, his Miguel moment, is when he wakes up, sees Luke standing over him, tries to kill him, and then murders his fellow students. Maybe even Grogu. But we still don't ever find out if maybe Ben was arrogant or prone to anger, if he felt the pressures of his famous bloodline. We're not even told about his feelings. Luke explains it as a darkness. I saw darkness. Snoke had already turned his heart. Now this whole sequence where Ben's tempted away and destroys the Jedi Academy should have been the subject of the first movie. Instead, all of this was revealed in a pretty crappy comic book. It's because Force Awakens starts in the middle of the story. Yes, A New Hope also starts in the middle of the story, but the narrative also begins when the status quo is about to change, when Luke Skywalker enters the chat. After Return of the Jedi, the new status quo was Luke and Leia rebuilding the galaxy. So this new story should have begun when everything Luke and Leia built started to fall apart. But instead, we hear about Ben's life from secondhand accounts, flashbacks, and implications. The franchise skipped straight to Ben being evil. Yet, without seeing his fall, I don't care about his redemption. And yes, I know we didn't see Vader's fall when Luke brought him back from the dark side, but we didn't need to. 
All that mattered is that Luke believed in him. Return of the Jedi was about whether or not Luke would succeed in redeeming Anakin, so we were rooting for Luke to win. Just like in these movies, we root for Ben to reject the dark side because it means that the good guys would win. And this is what separates the sequel trilogy from Cobra Kai. Cobra Kai uses nostalgia to tell a story about why nostalgia is dangerous. I'll let Don Draper explain. Nostalgia. It's delicate. But potent. Teddy told me that in Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. It's a twinge in your heart, far more powerful than memory alone. It takes us to a place where we ache to go again, and back home again, to a place where we know we are loved. In Cobra Kai, nostalgia is used as a dangerous motivator. It causes Daniel and Johnny to carry on their grudge and pass that grudge on to the next generation. I'm just going to add in a quick spoiler for Cobra Kai Season 3, so if you haven't seen it, skip to this time code. The show directly calls out living through nostalgia when Allie returns to the show. Allie says, Sometimes it's good to visit the past, to know where you are now. But you can't live in the past. She helps Daniel and Johnny to recognize that they are living in the past and need to focus on creating a better present and future for their children. But The Force Awakens exploits our nostalgia instead of telling a new story. There is nothing new in this movie. Every character has a counterpart in the original trilogy. When an OT cast member is revealed, it's with an applause break. Chewie, we're home. Even the Millennium Falcon gets a reveal. And because Force Awakens copied the exact same story structure as A New Hope, the movie was forced to introduce its villain after he turned evil. And so, Ben Solo got no character development. And that sucks, because it's easy to imagine an alternate Episode 7 that follows the Cobra Kai model, where maybe Ben Solo isn't that strong with the Force. He feels pressure to live up to his famous name, and that pressure causes him to become angry, or maybe he discovers that anger makes him a stronger Force user. Or maybe, like Miguel, he's impressed by the cool uniform of Vader, and the stories of how bad badass he was. Cobra Kai also uses nostalgia to help characters achieve a better understanding of one another. Johnny and Daniel take a test drive together that's a tour of Karate Kid locations. I don't believe but this experience is used to help them see one another as people and not enemies. It's crazy, man. Both finding karate role models. Cobra Kai uses nostalgia to reveal character, Force Awakens uses it to sell action figures. On Star Trek The Next Generation, Captain Picard has a standoffish relationship with the android Data. They aren't friends. Picard doesn't even seem to like him. Paragraph Mr. Data? Four. Sir? Shut up. But in the recent show, Picard talks about Data with fondness. Data was brave, curious, very gentle. So we, the audience, like Data, so now Picard likes Data. Picard has taken on the audience's point of view, so instead of us experiencing the story through his eyes, he experiences it through us. Force Awakens does the same thing, right here. When Han is talking to Rey, he's basically talking to the audience. It's true. The Force, the Jedi, all of it. The indulgence of nostalgia is fun. in the moment. But by the end of Rise of Skywalker, nostalgia makes the story ring hollow. Because we never knew who Ben Solo was or what Ben Solo wanted, we don't care that Ben Solo has returned. Instead, we do see Han forgiving him, which gives us permission to forgive him. Because after all, all of these characters just exist as audience proxies. Every young character in the sequel trilogy is a fan of the original heroes. But I will finish what you started. Luke Skywalker. I thought he was a myth. For me, she was royalty. Well, she certainly is that. It's like the movie can never tell its own story because everyone is too enraptured by the legends of the original trilogy. And you know why? Because the filmmakers grew up as such massive fans of the original trilogy and they passed this love to their characters on screen. Heck, even Last Jedi is about Luke's struggles to live up to his legend. Because I was Luke Skywalker, Jedi Master. And the movie ends with him being canonized 
as an action figure. This prevents these characters from ever stepping out of the shadows of the original heroes. And as a consequence, the story is just a vehicle for our nostalgia through their eyes. Force Awakens needs our nostalgia in lieu of world building or character development. The movie's not bold or groundbreaking or new, it's comfort food. Like going back to your old school cafeteria and eating that pizza, you know, that, that square pizza that made you fart, but it tasted really good. Cobra Kai shows us that a story works well when the characters are nostalgic. The Force Awakens proves that when the writers are nostalgic, the movie's just farting old pizza in your face. But that's just my opinion. Let me know yours in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.